How to read House of Leaves. Hello booktube, um, it's Zina from Beating Around the Books and today I'm doing a sort of um, int introductory video to House of Leaves and um, try to answer <laughs> the question of how to read this book. Um, the short answer is to pick it up and start at the beginning and read it like you would any other book <laughs> um, and anything that will arise as you know some sort of uh, difficulty when you are um, reading it will sort itself out when you get to it that makes no sense um, let me start again. So, I am doing this read-along, right? Um, in December and January, if you are interested. Um, and we have got quite a group together now on Boxer. Um, it's <laughs> much larger than I had anticipated. I didn't think so many people would be keen. But um, I'm glad, you know, that's really cool. But one thing that um, came up several times by different uh, people who haven't read it yet was how intimidated they felt about reading House of Leaves. And um, the question of whether or not to check out a guide to read um, House of Leaves beforehand um, and, you know, people having flicked through the pages and sort of being very confused and shocked or flabbergasted as to how one is meant to read um, things like, you know, a page like this. One example that might look a bit confusing. Um, there are, I'm sure, other ones, but um, yeah, let me not try and add to the intimidation. So. The reason I'm making this video is that I suggested to them that I would go into, um, I guess, a bit of my thoughts about the whole subject. And um, the reason why is that I was kind of a bit saddened by this idea that so many people are intimidated by this book. Now, I'm not going to say that this is for everyone and everyone will love it and it's like an easy read, but... Um, Gosh, I'm so glad that I didn't really have any expectations when I went into it. Um, I read this for a class which was called Unconventional Fictions, so I knew it was going to be unconventional. And then I had one friend who'd read it who, first of all, gushed over how amazing it was and how, um, well, different it was. Um, and he mentioned the fact that he now still wishes that he could find another book that does something similar to him as this one did. Um, but the main idea was he was a bit envious of me getting to read it for the first time. And the only thing he told me was to have two or more bookmarks on hand. That is all. So there was no intimidation in that sense, apart from knowing, OK, this is going to be different whatever. And I kind of I'm really glad that that's what happened to me and that I'm not you know, that I didn't know about the book beforehand. And I would like to try and, um, I don't know, make a case for shaking off that intimidation and just, you know, going for it. So, um, I'm not sure if I'll, if I'll put it in the title or in the thumbnail, but there is, um, so I'm going to do this slightly sort of um, little excursion into a rather niche um, term which is you know, from literary studies and it is ergodic literature or cybertexts and ergodic literature. Um, I've just tried to refresh my memory by reading the introduction to a book called uh, Cybertext Perspectives on Ergodic Literature which is from 1997 um, by one Espen J. Arseth. I don't know 
know if that's the correct um, pronunciation, but anyway, there you go. So um, I've only read the introduction. I could not get my hands on the whole book. In fairness, it might go over my head anyway. And so he, um, I think he coined the term ergodic literature um, to try and describe texts that, um, let me quote, um, require, wait, where is it? Anyway, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Texts that require, require non-trivial effort to allow the reader to traverse the text. Now that doesn't sound like fun, does it? Well, who knows? He's termed it from the word, from the Greek words, ergon and hodos, meaning work and path. So the reader must put a non-trivial amount of effort into, um, you know, working their way through a text. Um, and I am applying the term to this. <laughs> He did not because um, his book came out before this was published. Um, and then he speaks of cybertexts in a similar way. Um, and he makes examples, uh, he makes reference to things like choose your own adventure um, type of games, uh, well, books, you know, um, and also uh, computer games. And let me find what else is he talking about. Mm -mm -mm. No, I think, well, that's that's the main thing. Um, and he says that um, literary texts can also have this sort of structure, which requires a reader, which requires more participation um, on the, on the reader front than your conventional narrative, which is quite linear. We are not talking about linearity in terms of um, chronological order, but um, linearity in the almost like almost the physicality of reading in a way um, so he makes one example uh, which is quite you know i guess on a lower level of this sort of um, idea is the footnote um, when you see a footnote in a text you get to make a decision as a reader do i go back to the footnote do i go to the footnote jump away from the text read the footnote or do I continue and ignore the footnote? Um, or do I continue and then later read the footnote or read a whole bunch of footnotes in one go? Um, similar or even, even more so than um, our endnotes, right? You have, to, you have to make the decision, do I want to keep flicking back and forth? Or do I want to just completely ignore them? Or again, um, read, a, read a page or two and then read all the notes that are related to that page and then go back. Um, or you could read a few only, right? You could decide, oh, maybe this sounds interesting or this sounds important, uh, whereas this one does not. And by making that choice, you are also making a choice on what type of information you're going to, or, or the amount of information you're going to get and in what order you are going to get them. Um, and thereby, you might end up um, how do you say this? Mm, giving up on a certain amount of information as well, but you don't know what you're missing when you're making that choice, because to know that, you'll have to make a different one. Um, and um, so that is, you know, the sort of, like I said, I guess a lower level of, you know, work having to be uh, put into reading a text, and also um, a lower level of the reader influencing their reading experience and um, what they get from the text. Okay, and now this book, as we can see, has a lot of things going on that do not immediately tell you what to do with this, right? I mean, I guess you could, ooh, sorry, I have a lot of notes in here. Not anymore, I guess. You can start here, but then you wonder, do I jump here? Do I, um, what is going on with this, you know? And so you have to make those choices when you're, when you're there. Um, not everything in here is that weird. These are just the sort of um, typical kinds of pages that people share when they see House of Leaves. But anyway, um, and here we have several layers of a narrative um, and we also have footnotes. Not only do we have 
your regular footnote where, you know, theoretically you could say, okay, there's this very small choice of a reader to make. Okay, do I go there and read it or not? Um, but if you go and read it, then you immediately go back to the main text. So there's not that much, um, you know, there's not like a forking path in that sense in front of you. Um, there's more, it's more like, okay, do I go this diversion or not? Um, but here we also have footnotes within footnotes and then others that um, will maybe refer to something in the appendix and so on and so forth. So theoretically then as a reader, you get that choice as well. That do I go and, you know, possibly go on a path that leads me for another 50 pages away from the main narrative. And I'm saying main narrative because I find it difficult to actually determine what is the main here. Um, or do I not do it? Do I leave it completely out or do I maybe go there later? I feel like I'm repeating myself. And I think that level of choice for the reader is one sort of crucial aspect of the book. And I would be loath to prescribe to someone that they should, it, should do it one way over another, um, because that is in itself an interesting point of discussion later on, you know. Um, like, how did I feel about this? Did I, I had a, in the class that I um, attended after we read it, one, um, one of the people in the class mentioned that she ignored like possibly a third of the narrative in the first reading and then went back um, because she just couldn't be doing with it in that moment. And I, you know, that would have never been my style uh, because I think there's a, a slightly neurotic part in me that wants to kind of go and not miss anything. Um, but, you know, that was her path through the novel. And that's fine. And it'll, you know, it'll come out differently every time. One other example Arsef gives is The Unfortunates, which I have here. Hang on. Let me get it. I've mentioned it a couple of times, um, which is the perfect example of how, you know, every reader will have it. Not necessarily every reader, but most readers will have a different experience because this book is not found in book form. It is found in several different chapters and the only things that are set are the first and the last chapter. Everything else in between here is meant to be shuffled around and read in whatever order it comes out in. Um, and so that's why I think you shouldn't get a guide and you shouldn't um, be too worried about how one is supposed to read this. You're supposed to read it the way you want to read it. Um, <laughs> and, you know, experience that um, freedom of choice and how that will impact your reading of the novel. Um, there are some other points that Arsef makes that are quite interesting. They are about labyrinths and the different um, types of labyrinths there are, um, because we now think of labyrinths um, in only one way, although there are supposedly either two or even possibly three different way, different ones. Um, there is your basic unicursal and multicursal um, labyrinth. Un the unicursal one is, while disorienting if you are in it, um, is one that inevitably leads to the center. Um, whereas the other one, which is, I think, the one that we now have come to think of as a labyrinth, is the Borgesian uh, labyrinth that has all sorts of, um, how do you say this, like detours, alleyways, uh, you know, dead ends, and so on, where, you know, you, you're not necessarily going to get to the center or to the exit just by going you know, I don't know, left every single time or something like that. Um, and again, he then likens those different models of labyrinths to the idea of cybertexts, hypertexts, um, and ultimately to ergodic literature. Um, if you're interested in it, I'm going to leave a... Uh, 
leave the title for that book down there. I'm not sure if it's available online. I know I got it as, you know, I got it from my class. It might not be, but, um, you know, there might be something you want to look into. So I'm definitely going to leave at least the title of the book and the author. Um, so, <laughs> what was it? What is the too long didn't read equivalent to? Yeah, anyway. Um, what was I going to say? So, because I don't want to prescribe how you read this, if you feel like you need to know more about this before you go into it and you need to hear other people's opinions, um, then by all means do that. Who am I to tell you not to? I'm just trying to make a case for, I don't know, being an independent reader and, you know, go your own way. All right. Um, so I hope this wasn't too repetitive or too confusing. Um, I've only scratched the surface even of the, just the introduction. Um, I felt when I was reading it now, I felt like I've gotten a bit dumber since I read it last. Um, but um, yeah, if you would like to join the read along, there is still plenty of time to get a copy um, and to uh, join our group. Um, again, I will uh, leave my Voxer details down below and feel free to contact me so I can add you to the group. Um, okay, I would love to hear your thoughts if you've read it already um, about this type of thing. Would, do you wish you'd had a guide? Um, did you read it with knowing anything about it before or not? Um, and all that stuff. That would be lovely um, if anybody would like to weigh in. Okay, have a lovely day. Bye-bye.